Jedi, Sith and everybody in between, welcome to this edition of 101 Facts. I'm Sam and I'm here to talk to you today about the cultural zeitgeist that destroys all others in its path, like a hot Death Star super laser through Ewok. This is Star Trek 101. No, wait, sorry, that's not it. This is Star Wars 101. Number one, Star Wars is a six movie, two trilogy space opera film series from the brain of the impressively bearded writer-director George Lucas. Number two, Lucas was credited as a screenwriter on all the films except for The Empire Strikes Back. He also directed all the movies except for The Return of the Jedi and again The Empire Strikes Back. When asked which of the Star Wars movies is the worst, Lucas answered with, you guessed it, The Empire Strikes Back. He really hates Empire Striking Back, doesn't he? Number three, Star Wars was apparently inspired by Flash Gordon. No, not that one, the one that Queen sang their song about. Number four, in 2012, the Star Wars franchise, including box office takings, DVDs and video games, was estimated to be worth close to a huge $30 billion. Number five, also in 2012, the Walt Disney Company seemingly caught a bargain and bought Lucasfilm for just $4.05 billion. What a deal! Number six. In a move that confused the entire planet, the first film of the Star Wars series is episode four, A New Hope. Because, you know, who needs maths? Number seven. To be fair, it was originally entitled just Star Wars and later entitled episode four, A New Hope in a 1981 theatrical re-release. Still, pity the people who had missed the memo and saw episode five appear a few years later while quoking in fear that they'd slipped into a coma somehow and missed the other four. Number eight. Adjusting for all that economic inflation stuff that's happened over the years, this is the third highest grossing movie of all time, behind Gone with the Wind and Avatar. Number 9. Star Wars was also the first ever science fiction film to be nominated for the Best Picture Academy Award, which is fitting, because C-3PO kind of looks like one of those statues, don't you think? Number 10. A New Hope was what inspired a young James Cameron to quit his job as a truck driver and join the film industry in 1977. Number 11, A New Hope was the live action movie debut of a young actor called Mark Hamill. Number 12, Hamill was told about the Star Wars auditions by none other than Freddy Krueger himself, Robert England, who very kindly did not viciously murder him in his sleep, but encouraged him to try out for the role. Number 13, Hamill plays Luke Skywalker, the main protagonist of the original Star Wars trilogy. Originally, the character had the name Anakin Starkiller, which is not only needlessly aggressive, but also doesn't make sense. You can't really kill stars on your own, but then I guess you can't walk on the sky either. Number 14. When we first meet him, Skywalker is a moisture farmer on the desert planet of Tatooine. Tatooine was named after a town near the set in Tunisia called Tatooine. It's unknown whether or not there are real Jawas there though. Number 15. Episode 4 was also filmed in Guatemala, California and the UK. The studio unfortunately did not have the budget to go into actual outer space, which is a shame really. Number 16. Filming in Tunisia was so hot they had to change C-3PO's costume from plastic to fiberglass so it wouldn't melt. C-3PO actor Anthony Daniels felt so uncomfortable in the suit, he seriously considered not doing the rest of the film, which is understandable if you feel like you're walking around the desert in a golden slow cooker. Number 17. He did stick around though, so much so that he's the only actor to appear in all of the Star Wars films. It's like the old phrase goes, once you go gold, it never gets old. If that's not a line in the new trilogy, then I for one will be very disappointed. Number 18. Another thing that appears in every Star Wars film is the phrase, I have a bad feeling about this. I've got a bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling about this. I got a bad feeling about this. Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling about this. I've got a bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling about this. Hang on, one of those was wrong. Number 19. C-3PO is not the only droid with a man inside him. Stop laughing, you're better than that. Everybody's favourite bleeping dustbin R2-D2 is inhabited by English actor and stand-up comedian Kenny Baker. Number 20. Apparently when the cast and crew broke for lunch, they would quite often forget that Baker was inside the R2-D2 suit and leave without him, which is an image as tragic as it is funny. Number 21, Artie's famous bleeps and bloops were actually made by sound designer Ben Burt, mixing keyboard synthesizer sounds with himself imitating the noises a baby makes when it's trying to speak. If your baby does make R2-D2 noises, please seek medical attention. Number 22. Have you ever thought that a lightsaber sounds particularly like an old projector and television static combined? Because that's exactly how the noise was made, so well done you. 
number 23. Speaking of noises, Chewbacca's famous growls aren't recorded sounds of somebody stepping on a plug, but are actually manipulated recordings of animal noises. Ben Burt collected the sounds of bears, walruses, lions and badgers and combined them into the Wookiee talk we all know and love. Number 24. Chewbacca's role as the non-English speaking co-pilot was inspired by Lucas's dog sitting up in the front seat of his car. Ah. In fact, Chewbacca's name is derived from the Russian word for dog, Sobaka. Whether or not Lucas's dog is eight foot tall like Chewbacca is, is unknown, but kind of unlikely. Number 25. Chewbacca is one of the only fictional characters to ever receive a Lifetime Achievement Award at the MTV Movie Awards, which probably says a lot more about MTV than it does Chewbacca. Number 26. Chewbacca is played by English actor Peter Mayhew, who is over seven feet tall. He says apparently all it took for him to get the role was for him to simply stand up. Pfft, show off. Number 27. Before he played Chewie, Mayhew was an orderly at a hospital in Yorkshire. Number 28. Mark Hamill claims that studio executives were originally unhappy that Chewbacca was running around without clothes on and tried to give him shorts. It quite obviously did not work, and Chewie is still as naked as the day he was born, or hatched, or spawned, or wherever he came from. Where did he come from? Besides, would you try to put clothes on him against his will? <laughs> Didn't think so. Number 29. Everyone knows that Chewie can't be without his best friend Han Solo, who is a giant green alien with gills. Or at least he would be, if the original draft had stayed in place. What are you looking at? Number 30. Harrison Ford famously portrays Han, but it very nearly wasn't him. George Lucas's first choice was actually the walking gold watch hiding place, Christopher Walken. I hid this uncomfortable hunk of metal up my ass two years. Other actors on the solo list included Jack Nicholson, Sylvester Stallone and Burt Reynolds. Number 31. Harrison Ford did a lot of improv as solo across the trilogy, not learning his lines for the intercom scene to make it seem more realistic, and at the director's behest, ad-libbing the now iconic line, Number 32. Han's beloved ship, the Millennium Falcon, was inspired by a half-eaten hamburger on a plate with an olive on the side. By that logic, the Death Star was probably inspired by a Malteser, or maybe even a Kinder Egg. Number 33. The Death Star itself is 160 kilometers in diameter, and had a population of 1.7 million people. That's definitely no moon. That's no moon. Yes, thanks, I just said that. Number 34. It's not exaggerating to say that one of the biggest debates in the history of mankind is whether or not Han Solo shot Greedo first. Originally, Greedo did not shoot at all, but George Lucas then changed this in the 1997 special edition so a small laser blast appeared from Greedo's gun, because he felt without it, Han looked like a cold-blooded killer. Fans were outraged at this, so in 2004, it was re-edited again, so they fire at a similar time. Oh, glad that's sorted now. Number 35. Everybody's favourite member of royalty who looks like her hair has come out of a bakery, Princess Leia, is portrayed by Carrie Fisher. Number 36. She was almost played by stars such as Sigourney Weaver, Gina Davis and Sissy Spacek. Number 37. Fisher's breasts were taped down with gaffer tape as the flowing white costume she wore would unfortunately make her bra look very visible. It seems space doesn't have lingerie, but it does have tape. Interesting to know. Hope you're taking notes there, NASA. Number 38. In the scene in which Luke and Leia swing towards safety, Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill actually did their own stunts. It's unknown whether or not Harrison Ford did his own stunts, but it's probably best he didn't, because, you know. He was the solo occupant of this small plane. The crash occurred around 2.30 p.m. Number 39. Despite the fact it's a major plot point, Leia and Obi-Wan Kenobi never actually meet one another in A New Hope. She does see him from a distance, however, if that counts, I've met Jennifer Lawrence in her own house. Number 40. Obi-Wan Kenobi actor Alec Guinness apparently said to his friends while making the film that it was fairy tale rubbish with excruciating dialogue, but said that the end product was an exciting but noisy spectacle. Sorry, Alec, I know you didn't speak like that at all. Number 41. That being said, for saying the excruciating dialogue in the noisy spectacle, he was nominated for the Best Supporting Actor Oscar. So it wasn't that bad, was it Guinness? Number 42. In the scene in which Kenobi is shuffling around inside the Death Star at a great height, he's actually only six feet off the ground. The drop and the background is actually a painting. Number 43. Bit of a spoiler alert for this one, but since the film has been around for nearly 40 years, it's your own fault if you haven't caught up. 
Famously in A New Hope, Kenobi appears to die at the hand of Darth Vader. Well, either that or he pulls off a fabulous escape Houdini would be jealous of. Alec Guinness claims that Kenobi's death was his idea as he didn't want to be in any sequels. But George Lucas says that he was angry when he discovered that Kenobi was going to die, so nobody knows the real story. Number 44. Speaking of old Darth, everybody's favourite asthmatic sounding warlord only has 12 minutes of screen time in A New Hope. Number 45. He's physically played by David Prowse, while his booming voice is provided by James L. Jones. Number 46. Vader in Dutch means father, which may or may not be a reference to an important plotline further down the road. I don't want to, you know, ruin that for you, but... No. I am the father. Well, damn it. Number 47. Well, I guess with that spoiler, we now have to move on to the next move in the franchise, The Empire Strikes Back. Episode 5 made a whopping $538 million at the box office worldwide. Number 48. The film also won an Oscar for Best Sound Design. Number 49. The scenes set on ice planet Hoth were filmed at a glacier in Finns, Norway, quite often in sub-zero temperatures. I bet the C-3PO and Chewbacca actors were suddenly delighted with their costumes. Number 50. I guess you don't know everything about women. Mm. Ooh, that's weird. Number 51. Han Solo gets his paws on a lightsaber in the opening act of the film, becoming the only non-Jedi character to do so in the original trilogy. Number 52. The Empire Strikes Back is also where the series introduces over-microwaved P lookalike and Jedi Master Yoda, whose name in the original script was Buffy. We can see why they changed it, you know, defeating Sith and vampire slaying would be too much to do for one little guy. 53, number! Yet a species is a complete mystery as it's never clarified, which is odd considering there are over 248 named alien races in the Star Wars canon. Number 54. To put Yoda on the big screen, the production team considered everything from a small child in a costume to even a monkey in a mask. As disappointing as it is that Grandmaster Yoda isn't an ape in disguise, they instead contacted Muppeteer Frank Oz, the voice of Miss Piggy and the Cookie Monster, who helped create Yoda as a puppet and gave him his trademark voice. Number 55. Scientists in 2012 have even bestowed Grandmaster Yoda the ultimate honour and have named an oceanic worm after him. It's called the Yoda Purparata, so called because its shape reminded them of Yoda's floppy little ears. Number 56. The Atat Walker and Tauntaun scenes were filmed using stop motion animation techniques, taking an hour per on screen second, or in other words, bloody ages. One of those guys was Phil Tippett, who then went on to be a dinosaur supervisor for the Jurassic Park series. If only he had his head in the game then. People died, Phil. People died. Number 57. The noise the Tauntauns make is actually a recording of an Asian sea otter called Moda. Number 58. The film went over budget by more than $10 million. That, that otter was a bit of a diva. Number 59. Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher had such a height difference that Fisher had to stand on a box quite a lot of the time just to appear in frame with him in the more intimate scenes. Thank goodness Yoda and Chewie never got close or they'd need a crane. Number 60. For the famous, no, I am your father, line, the director only told Mark Hamill that this was the true line. At the time of recording the scene, the fake line, Obi-Wan killed your father, was given instead. Number 61. Every time Luke appears upside down in this film, he uses the force. That rush of midichlorians to the head must do the trick. More on those later. Number 62. 30 deaths appear on screen in episode 5, which sounds like a lot, but actually it's the lowest of the entire saga. Number 63. With a 95% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, The Empire Strikes Back is the critically highest rated of all the Star Wars movies. Number 64. In 1983, episode 6, entitled Return of the Jedi, was released. Number 65. Twin Peaks director David Lynch was approached to direct Return of the Jedi, but he declined saying he didn't like science fiction. Ironically, a year later, he would go on to direct Dune, a sci-fi movie now infamous for being such a huge box office bomb. Number 66. Steven Spielberg and, weirdly, body horror lover David Cronenberg were both also asked to direct. Both declined and the directing job went to Richard Marquand instead. Thank God. Lord alone knows what Cronenberg would have done with those poor Ewoks if he got his hands on them. Number 67. The film was codenamed Blue Harvest to avoid locations overcharging, which happened several times in the production of The Empire Strikes Back. Number 68. In the scene when C-3PO is being attacked by Jabba the Hutt's pet thing, Salacious Crumb, Anthony Daniels' cries are real as he's actually having a panic attack. What a method actor. Number 69. 
Carrie Fisher seemed to channel fanboys and perverts everywhere when she complained her costume in the previous two movies did not show off that she was a woman enough. Basically, it covered her bod up too much. This led to the now infamous Jabba Slave Girl bikini she found herself in. The bikini was made of metal, so there had to be repeated reshoots due to wardrobe malfunctions that they had to... <laughs> nip in the bud, if you excuse the pun. Number 70. Intergalactic slug hustler and Donald Trump lookalike Jabba the Hutt is one of the most expensive puppets ever made, costing a staggering half a million dollars. He also took at least three people to physically operate, including one lucky chap dedicated to his tail. And you complain about your job. Number 71. When Darth Vader is unmasked for the world to see, it's actually the face of Sebastian Shaw, a completely different actor to the person that's been playing him in the films up till that point. Oh, he looks tired, doesn't he? Have a cup of tea, mate, it'll perk you ru- Oh, no way, he's dead. Number 72. Actually, an apparently pitched ending to this scene involved Luke putting on Darth's mask and becoming the new Darth Vader, saying, I will crush the rebels and I will rule the universe. This admittedly badass moment was taken off the table when Lucas realized how incredibly depressing that ending is. Number 73. Return of the Jedi also introduces us to the race of living teddy bears that are the Ewoks. Ah, oh, aren't they cute? One of those Ewoks is Wicket, played by actor Warwick Davis, who was chosen because R2-D2 actor Kenny Baker, who was meant to be playing Wicket, got food poisoning on the day. Number 74. The Ewoks are said to be named after the Native American tribe, the Miwok, who lived in the forest that doubled for Endor in the movie. Number 75. Admiral Ackbar's voice was performed by radio actor Eric Bowersfield, who apparently came up with the voice just by looking at a picture of the character. It's a trap. Number 76. In the 2004 special edition DVD, Sebastian Shaw's Anakin Skywalker Force Ghost is replaced with Hayden Christensen, who played Anakin in the prequels. Oh yes, speaking of which, number 77. Yes, in 1999 the prequel series of movies kicked off, this time obeying the laws of mathematics and starting with episode 1, The Phantom Menace, then episode 2, Attack of the Clones, before ending on episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Number 78. When the trailer for The Phantom Menace debuted in 1998, many theatres reported people buying tickets for the movies, watching the Star Wars trailer, then leaving before the main film even begun. The days of being a fanboy before YouTube sure sounded hard and expensive. Number 79. Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman and Kurt Russell were all considered for the part of Qui-Gon Jinn, the Jedi played by Liam Neeson. Number 80. In retrospect, they may have wanted to go with one of those guys because Liam Neeson's height caused an extra $150,000 in set construction cost. The sets were built to be only slightly taller than the actors, so the rest of the frame could be filled in with CGI. But Liam was taller than they thought, so they had to build more stuff. Who'd have thought just a few Neeson inches would end up costing so much? Number 81. Tupac Shakur was a massive fan of Star Wars and was asked by George Lucas to audition for the role of Mace Windu. His tragic death in 1996 meant this never came into fruition. Number 82. Mace Windu went to Samuel L. Jackson instead. Windu's lightsaber is unique in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's purple, which Jackson wanted so he could identify himself in big battle scenes amid a sea of blue, red and green sabers. Secondly, it apparently has the words bad motherfucker engraved on it too, because Samuel L. Jackson apparently can't use any prop that doesn't have that written on it. Bad, Number 83. Ewan McGregor plays Obi-Wan Kenobi in The Phantom Menace. He apparently kept making lightsaber noises whenever he filmed battle scenes, so he had to gently be reminded that they would be added on later. Number 84. McGregor's brother Colin is an RAF pilot who apparently works under the code name OB2. Do you see what they did there? 1 and 2, OB1 and 2. Clever. Clever. Give him that. Number 85. The Phantom Menace also introduced the world to one of the most beloved characters in the history of film. Jar Jar Binks. He's played by Ahmed Best, whose performance captures and voices him, and in one of the greatest film mysteries of all time, was shamefully not nominated for any award for his performances. What were you thinking, Academy? Number 86. Horny Sith Master Darth Maul has a total of 10 horns on his head, and only blinks once throughout the entire film. He was also voiced by comedic actor Peter Serafinowicz. Number 87. The prequels introduced the idea of midichlorians, the bizarre idea of talking blood cells that live inside humans and tell them what the Force wants them to do and... I'll, I'll let Neeson take over from here. Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. Inside your cells, yes. And we are symbionts with them. Symbionts? Life forms living together for mutual advantage. Without the midichlorians, 
life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. Just what? Number 88. The terrifyingly voiced Christopher Lee plays Count Dooku in Attack of the Clones. His name is a reference to the Japanese name for poison, but it had to be changed to Dukan in Brazil, because in Portuguese, Dooku means from the arse, which is a far less imposing, but far more hilarious name. Number 89! Hair-gelled boy band and Sync were originally going to appear in Attack of the Clones after George Lucas's daughter harassed him to include them, but they had to say ba 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 to those scenes after they were cut because of fan outcry. <laughs> Number 90. Episode 2's working title was Jar Jar's Big Adventure, which was probably in the hope that if anybody found a leaked version with that title they would rather shoot themselves in the head than watch anything with that name. Number 91. With a budget of $120 million, Attack of the Clones is the most expensive Star Wars film ever made. So far. Number 92. For episode 3, Hayden Christensen gained 24 pounds by eating 6 meals a day. So if you're thinking of being a Sith Lord, then pack on those pounds and get on that ice cream. Number 93. Every single clone trooper in episode 3 is CGI, none of them were physically made. Number 94. Originally in episode 3, a young Han Solo was meant to appear and be seen living with Wookiees like a furry Brady Bunch, but later this was cut. Number 95. The original cut of episode 3 was a bum-numbing four hours long, which is enough to turn anyone to the dark side. Number 96. The Star Wars franchise in total has made $12 billion in toy sale revenue. At least 10 of those millions must have come from Jar Jar masks. Number 97. The 4th of May is now celebrated worldwide as International Star Wars Day because, as the old phrase goes, may the 4th of May be with you. Number 98. The first in a new sequel trilogy of films, The Force Awakens, will be released in December of 2015. You'll be able to tell when it's out from the floods. Floods either caused by tears of sweet, sweet joy or tears of crushing, unbearable disappointment. You were the chosen one! Number 99. It'll be directed by lens flare lover and Ultimate Geek director J.J. Abrams, who is also in the co-writer's chair too, if they have chairs for that. I don't imagine they write standing up, so they, I guess they must. Number 100. The first trailer for the movie set a new world record for being the most viewed trailer in its first 24 hours at a staggering 30.65 million views in its first day. That's like if everybody in Hawaii watched it 30 times each, which, to be fair, they probably did. Number 101. There are five more Star Wars movies planned across the next five years, so if you don't love Star Wars now, you're going to have to learn to. Chewie, we're home. That right there was 101 facts about Star Wars, and I don't know about you, but I had a lovely time. If you want more 101 fact videos, then please click on Moda the Diva Otter now. She's waiting for you. Go on, give it a click. Just click it. All you need to do, just one click and then boom, 101 facts forever. Not forever. I mean, you know, I'm not a robot. Bye.